All right, so welcome. Um, we have a couple of things today to do. Uh, some of them are related to logistics of the course, and some of them are related to what we want to do in the course. So um, first things first, uh, if you go to the uh, labs, you will notice that the labs have three new things. Uh, and those are placeholders for two obliques and the assignment. Uh, the oblique two is not prepared yet. It's work in progress. So if you go there, it says work in progress uh, somewhere yeah, here, work in progress. That means it's uh, not released, so to say. Uh, but if you go to oblique one, it is supposed to be released. Uh, of course, once we release something is in a maintenance mode, so there might be bugs, there might be some issues, so we may need to fix it. So if there are some problems, you let me know. But the idea is already here. And the idea is that you will kind of prepare um, a short summary in bullet points related to the readings that you've done for the two books. So the oblique one was supposed to be based on a couple of chapters from the Haskell book and from the Rust book. Uh, and those elements are kind of listed here. So I've listed what you should pay attention and what are kind of the chapters that we are covering. So we're covering nine chapters from the Haskell book and we're covering uh, 10 chapters from uh, Rust book. So up to chapter nine, together with chapter 13 for the functional features of Rust. Um, there are two important chapters. So the most important chapter in Haskell is the chapter six. Uh, that's the probably the most, um, it's not the hardest, but it's the most important one. And then there is um, there are two chapters which are important in Rust. So the, the borrow checker, that's a kind of a new concept uh, in Rust. So chapter four is, is kind of important. And then uh, chapter 13, because it links Rust to, to Haskell. So chapter 13 is kind of on the concept level, the two languages are kind of the same, but on the syntax level, they are different. And of course, Rust uh, has doesn't have a garbage collector, so you have to take care of the memory management yourself. So chapter 13, are, so chapter four and 13 are kind of the important ones uh, and chapter six in, in, in Haskell. So what, what do you ex are expected to do? You're expected to do to write a short uh, ballot points of what you have learned uh, and what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, right? So it's sort of like a self-assessment of the material that we covered in the books. Uh, and you basically say, yeah, false, yeah, I, I kind of need to work more on false, uh, recursion, yeah, I'm fine, uh, whatever, right? So the basic syntax, you should have it kind of memorized. Uh, some of the things you can look up, but you basically write a short summary of what is that you have learned and how you assess yourself. So it's kind of a self-assessment. Um, the things that you assess yourself to not be comfortable with, of course, you know, that's a feedback that we need to spend more time on it. So that's why we're doing it. Uh, the things that you say that you are comfortable with, then we kind of say, yeah, that's great. That, then that it's covered. So then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to show some of the code that you've done while you were learning all those things and kind of a demonstrate that you've covered the, the material, right? Um, the session is short, so we're not gonna spend an hour, you know, you're showing us millions of lines of code. It's like, you know, five or less minutes. So it's very brief, right? So you kind of very briefly say, I've done those things and I've used those things in, in those projects or those labs or whatever it was, right? So it's not intended to be like a, an exam, like it's not a long thing. It's a very kind of a quick check, like a tick box, right? Uh, and then, um, yeah, so this this kind of oral show and tell, and then you kind of show the code um, while you're doing the show and tell. So you're supposed to have some code, uh, either for the labs or for the assignment or for the projects you've been working on. And you kind of, by showing the code, you will say, yeah, I've done this and I've done this and, and so on. And the purpose of this is that you use the language, you use the terms, that you use the uh, the syntax and the structure of the of the material. And we kind of refer to those, uh, to those chapters, right? So it's kind of a linking it together. Um, so it's not us asking you, it's kind of you telling us, 
and then you can tell it to the teaching assistant or you can tell it to me uh, and then we just take you off, right? So there is not really kind of uh, like a traditional thing that you need to do some coding and show us the code. It's more you kind of reflecting of, of what you've learned, right? So it's a little bit different to that traditional kind of assignment where we give you a task, you do the task and then we kind of assess how you've done the task. It's like, you just reflect what you've read. If, if, if you don't have to read the books, right? We, we discussed it at the beginning that it's not actually literally important that you read the books, you know, cover to cover, but you kind of need to understand the concepts from those chapters. So you kind of need to reflect, oh, do I understand false? No, then I have to read about it, right? Do I need, I need to do some exercises. And then you just show us that, that you've done it. Uh, if you haven't done it, you say, yeah, I haven't done it. I, I don't know about false, right? Well, fair enough, but you know, it, it's, it's you that you need to learn those things. So um, the assessment is kind of, it's a feedback for us where you are, such that we can plan the second kind of part of the course uh, and also like how you're progressing. And it's kind of a re reflection on yourself. Um, so it's, I, I think it's relatively uh, stress-free. It's kind of up to you how, how you want to do it. It should be short. The, the report should be short, just use bullet points. Don't write us, you know, pages of, of stuff. Um, just, you know, follow, probably follow the, the structure of the chapters and say, yeah, you know, tick, 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 tick. Oh, this one I need to work more, tick, 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 and so on. Um, and the code, that's why we're doing the labs and that's why we're doing the assignments so you can use it. But if, you know, strictly speaking, you can use your own code as well. And if you're doing, if you're reading the books or if you're doing the kind of the assignments from the books, you can show us the uh, the code, but the code needs to be committed somewhere. It, it, you cannot show us the code, which is kind of uh, hanging. It needs to be in your workspace, right? So it has to be committed to Git. So that's the oblique, oblique one. So as I said, it's a little bit unconventional. It's not a traditional assignment that you have to do. It's something that you just reflect on uh, what you've read and what you've done. Uh, and it, it's supposed to be short. And the mechanics is that uh, we have these obliques in the labs and then you use the issue tracker and you say, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, can I have a five minutes with a teaching assistant? And with the teaching assistant, because he's in Trondheim, we will always do it online. Uh, but with me, we can either do it online or we, you can pop into my office or we can do it in the lab like on Thursdays and I just sit with you for five minutes, you tell me your, your things and then I take you off, right? Uh, but everyone needs to be taken off. So everyone needs to meet with me or teaching assistant and have this done. That That's the oblique part. Uh, the mechanics is kind of a little bit flexible, right? Any questions about this? Yep. No, so there is no deadline for this, but if everybody waits until the last week and everybody asks us, oh yeah, can I have five minutes? Then there will be people who will not get time, okay? So there is a bit of a risk of not having a deadline. So maybe you want to have a deadline, right? Such that you have a guarantee that everybody will get a time allocated. Uh, it's a little bit up to you, right? But I was thinking because it's kind of non-public thing, it's only me or the teaching assistant reviewing you, we technically don't need a deadline, but obviously the semester has a deadline and we have capacity, right? So if I have 40 students in the last day asking me for five minutes, I may have to turn some students down, right? So there is a growing risk at the end of the course that you may not make it, right? So it's kind of good to have it done before that. Um, but it's up to you. If you want to have a deadline, we can set the deadline. And then we will have the buffer, like, you know, we can set the deadline, say two weeks before the end of semester, that that's the deadline. But then, you know, if somebody misses that deadline, it kind of is the same as if you miss the, the deadline without the deadline. So I don't know, like, what, what do you prefer? Do you prefer no deadline or do, do you want to have a deadline? It's, it's literally just up to you, right? Um, because I, I don't care. <laughs> All right, so if there is a suggestion about the deadline or if there are some questions, just post it to this to this project, right? So everything related to Oblig One goes into the discussion and the issue tracker in, into the Oblig One, not into the course, because then we will have it in one place, right? It will be a little bit easier to track. 
Um, and also you will, if once you're ready, you just post, you make a new issue uh, and you say, yeah, I kind of uh, pre-populated some, um, some labels. So you basically say, I want approval request. And then either me or the teaching assistant will kind of handle your case. We will kind of follow up and set a, a time for this to happen. Um, it needs to happen kind of a face-to-face, -face, either online or physically. And then you kind of uh, show us the, the things. Um, all right, so that's oblique one. Uh, oblique two is not ready yet. I want to see how it works. And I want to have some, some initial kind of uh, runs with the students and see how oblique one works. And then we will kind of set the similar pattern for oblique two. So I will kind of do that. Uh, if we have, you know, deadline for oblique one, we kind of will have deadline for oblique two, but it, like initially I was thinking, I, I don't care. I mean, and people can do both at the same time too. So once you once we publish what oblique two is, you can kind of do at the same session, right? If you want. Um, but I want to to wait a little bit to get feedback on oblique one and if how it works and how you feel about it, right? So then we set this one. Um, the intention is to have it similar. It's it will not be like a project. It will not be like a task for you to do. It will be just reflection of the other concepts from the other chapters of the books, which are a little bit more advanced. So I will kind of list them a little bit more precisely of what the intention is. Because um, let, let's have a quick look. Um, it basically says the rest of the books, but there is quite a lot of kind of a more complicated concepts in the rest of the chapters. Uh, and for example, it says monad transformers are not included, but you know, I want to be a little bit more precise what is included and what is not included, right? So the applicatives using maps and fmaps, uh, using the more complicated composition on the monadic structures, that what we would like to get. Uh, but in, in some sense, like monad transformers are easier, like it's easy to use them, like, uh, but it's much harder to understand what they do, like, and how they work. So it, it's, I don't know yet, like uh, I will have to think about it because uh, last year, for example, some people did use monad transformers without fully understanding how they work because they are quite easy to use and they are very powerful. They make your kind of code and your kind of uh, compositions much nicer. Uh, but if I ask you like how it is implemented and how it works, people have trouble because it is kind of complicated. So the complexity is sometimes not in the syntax or in the usage, but in the way it actually works. Uh, and then some things are kind of um, uh, complicated of how they work. Yeah, so so anyway, I, I will kind of list here what uh, what is kind of uh, what the intention is. Um, so we can do it later. All right, so that's the um, the obliques. Any questions about this? If not, let me talk a little bit about the assignment. So, we have um, on the homepage of the of the course there is a section called assignments, and this section uh, lists uh, certain professional practices that you have to do, and it lists some of the documentation that you will have to do about your assignment. And it is again a little bit unconventional because I will not give you the actual spec of the task that you have to do. So for example, in PROC 205, Christopher gave you like a specification of what you need to develop. Uh, and it is sort of like a task that you need to do. Um, the task that you will need to do for assignment one is in, in my head. It's not written in the actual text. You have to write it as a specification, as a requirement yourself. Right, so your part of the task for assignment one is for you to write what the spec is, not for me to give you the spec, but for you to write it down. Um, so that is what this document is, is the required specification. Uh, you will have to write it down, like you will have to write the points and the content context of what you are developing for assignment one. And you will need to get it from my head. And we will do it by me telling you what I want, 
and you're asking me questions, okay? Um, so that's the first document. And then uh, there are some non-functional requirements, which I, as a customer, have no idea about, right? I don't know about tests. I'm just a dumb person who wants something developed, and you are the professionals who know how to professionally develop it, and you have to specify what those non-functional requirements are, right? Uh, you can ask me questions like, you know, how long do I want to wait for the reaction of clicking a mouse, but... For example, the time delays or the re memory requirements or performance requirements, I don't have clue about it, right? You should define them yourself. So that's the second document. It's the non-functional requirements. How much code test coverage you want? What do you want to test? Do you want to have unit tests or end-to-end -end tests? You have to decide in the context of the problem what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and you have to write it down. And then it will become the requirements for the uh, non-functional elements, right? So what are the non-functional elements? It's like the performance, memory footprint, uh, code quality, maintainability, how you modularize your, your solution, uh, how you're going to deal with the development itself. Will you split it into multiple modules or libraries or will it be a monolithic solution? All those things are kind of a non-functional, right? I, as a customer, I don't know. Like, I don't know what module is. Uh, in a sense, right? So that's the second document. And then you will have to obviously use the uh, GitLab to do it. So you will have to use the issue tracker and you will have to link your commits to the issue tracker. So there is a certain professional practice which is looked into as well uh, because you have to kind of link uh, the issues to the commits and you have to organize yourself of how you're doing it, right? So that's the middle part. And then once you've implemented it, then you have to uh, have a, a document kind of assessing whether you've done it well, right? So it's uh, the requirements specification and the non-functional requirements documents, they specify what the product will be like, like what the product should have, what features it should have in the requirements and what non-functional features it should have as a kind of um, side effect of you developing it. And then the assessment is you kind of assessing, you're looking into yourself as if you were a separate team and you're assessing if they've done a good job, right? So if they follow a good practices. So for example, you may say, did the commits link to the issues or did, do the commit have meaningful messages? Uh, how the um, uh, merge requests were handled? Like, was it kind of uh, professionally done? What was the test kind of covered well and so on. So you're kind of looking back into those two things plus the process and plus the product and kind of assessing yourself, right? Uh, and you're doing it in two parts. The first part is you're writing the kind of a assessment criteria and then you're assessing yourself. So th that's the self-assessment, right? So you're writing what you will be looking at. Is there a readme, for example? It will be here. Right. So assessment specification will say, is there a readme file? Right. And is the readme file written kind of meaningfully? And is are the you know uh, installation instructions and so on. So this is the specification for assessment. And then you will say, yes, I have a readme file. Yes, the readme file is perfect. It's like a level description of everything and installation instructions are there. Right. So then you will self assess yourself. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, because you will use the same assessment that you've used for yourself, you will use for another two projects. So you will use this assessment criteria to assess another two projects that uh, we will do after people submit the uh, assignment, right? So you'll not only assess yourself, but you will use the same criteria to assess other two projects. Um, so then you will use this document, right? Um, and then you have to have a short video uh, for um, presenting your product and presenting what you've done. Uh, why are we doing it? Because you can use it for the portfolio and then some external reviewer can use it to, grade, to give you a grade, right? Um, in the course, we sort of using only the, the tick boxes. Like I tick you for the obliques and we tick you for the assignments. And then for the actual grade, that will be part of the portfolio such that the kind of a, me and a, an external will kind of review you. So that, that's why we have to have a video such that we don't have this interactive session. We have it kind of um, 
pre-recorded such that the external can also use it for uh, giving you a grade, right? Um, and then you keep everything in the in the workspace in the uh, Git repo with the markdown files and everything. Those four things: this recommend requirements specification, non-functional requirements the assessment specification and the self-assessment report, they can be four different documents, or you can just have like one page on a markdown and have everything there, like just four sections, or you can organize it the way you want. It, it doesn't matter, but you just need to have those four things for both assignments, assignment one and assignment two. Any questions about this? I'm sure it's a little bit, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Like uh, last year we had the limit of 10 minutes and it worked, but it's just a guide. Like if you do 12 minutes or five minutes, that it's fine. Uh, be reasonable. <laughs> so, you know, don't don't make half an hour, you know, walk through everything. Um, yeah, I guess I can put some sort of a, uh, guided uh, hints. So, uh, let's say around 10 minutes is probably reasonable. If you go over time a little bit, that's fine. But if you kind of stretching it too much, then maybe it becomes a bit unreasonable, right? Yeah. Uh, and you don't technically on this video, you don't need to really show yourself. You just have to show the code. You need to show some of the documents and talk through the demo maybe, show a demo. Um, but you don't necessarily need to show your face. Uh, for the obliques, yeah, it has to be kind of interactive and you kind of need to be, it, it needs to be face to face. But for this, yeah, it doesn't matter. All the assignments and all the obliques and all the work in this course is individual. So there is no group work, but you can collaborate in a sense of talking with each other and kind of um, uh, solving some things together. And then you just need to, indicate that that happened, right? So if you, let's say, worked on assignment one with some other student, uh, you have to say, we collaborated on those parts. Uh, you technically not supposed to reuse the code because you individually graded. So each of you should write your own code yourself, uh, but you can talk and you can sort of solve things together. And it's a little bit hard, like when you're working with someone to have completely different code bases, uh, so maybe you have to kind of across reference each other and say, yeah, I work on, on this method. I work with this student and we may have similar outcome, right? Uh, technically you should not have identical outcome though, uh, because you should be doing it yourself. But, um, yeah, there is a bit of a fuzziness and we will allow it, right? If there is some similarity, but you cross reference each other, that's fair enough. Uh, but if you do have a lot of similarity and you don't reference another student's work, then it may be considered as a plagiarism, right? So try to avoid it. Be kind of um, open about with whom you, you've worked and who contributed what, right? Even though all the work is individual. Um, okay, so this is... Um, this is important because there is a lot of expectation on your professionalism, which is kind of implied, right? Uh, not actually given to you by the customer. Um, so last year we had a task for assignment one, which was related to doing calculations on the currencies on Euro, right? And a lot of student implementations, they were losing money. Like we were doing some accounting and the implementations were using floats and there were implementations which basically were losing money. So when you had customers paying and then you do the accounting, you, you have like 500 euro missing in the books, right? There was 500 euro missing either on the customer side or on the shop owner side, right? That's unacceptable. You cannot have software which steals or produces money, right? You cannot have rounding errors which accumulate and then make money disappear or money being created. Um, that was not part of the spec, right? But I didn't tell the students that money should not disappear or should not be created. And stu some students were surprised that I marked them down for you know, stealing money, right? With the implementations. Why would you be surprised? Like, would you expect a software to kind of create money out of the thin air or, or steal money from, from people? No. 
Uh, so some expectations and some assumptions are implied and you have to be aware of them and you have to kind of spell them out yourself as a professional, right? Uh, it will not be the customer telling you, no, no, your software should not kill patients, right? If you're doing medical software and you just happen to kill patients, it's like, whoops, right? No, 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 it's kind of up to you. You have to have some kind of a professional integrity and you have to think what the software could and cannot do. Uh, so rounding errors in financial systems is unacceptable because you're creating or, or stealing money, right? Uh, and students were surprised, like, okay, I just use floats and, you know, that's what happens. No, then you should use ints and you should do rounding yourself and you should make sure money are not created and money are not lost. Um, so then I told them that and then the, some students were kind of happy to learn about it and then they kind of redo the implementations and some were upset. So for those of you who might be upset, it's not my fault or customer fault, it's your fault. You are the professionals. You have to think what the people are kind of forgetting to tell you, but it's important, right? You're making those decisions. You're making the decisions whether you're using flows or ints. And if you're using flows, you will have rounding errors and you will be kind of losing decimal places and you have to deal with it. In some situations, that's okay. In some situations, that's completely unacceptable. So you're making those decisions, right? And in this course, we are kind of on the level that we want you to learn this. We want you to kind of be aware of those assumptions and those things that you have to spell out yourself. Um, because the customer will not tell you that. The customer, you know, if you're working with a doctor and the doctor tells you what you what the doctor wants from the software, the doctor will not tell you, don't kill my patients. <laughs> because the doctor will think implicitly that you know that, right? And that happens a lot of time. A lot of time the customer implies that it's obvious and they will not tell you, but it's not obvious, right? Uh, you have to kind of spell it out. You have to be precise enough that you will kind of know. There is uh, there is a joke. Uh, uh, two people like a uh, English professor and a programmer and a computer scientist are traveling north in England in a train and the English professors, and they both see some, some cows in the horizon, and the English professor says, oh, we are already in Scotland, I can see cows. And the programmer says, no, 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 we're not sure if we are already in Scotland, because what we see is we see some two-dimensional projections of an animals, which on our side appear to be black, <laughs> and on our side, they appear to look like cows but we don't know how they look from the other side and we don't know if they are really cows. So it's, you know, it's a stupid joke, but it means that normal people make a lot of implied assumptions about reality, which us as programmers, we cannot do that because we have to be much more precise of what we tell the computer to do and how the computers work. So the fact that you see something from that side with certain things doesn't mean that it's kind of, symmetric it may not be right so it's the same here you have to make your own kind of judgments and your own um, clarifications so i the customer will not tell you use floats or use ints right you making those decisions and you making those decisions with the uh, certain implications all right so that was kind of a long introduction about uh, professionalism i did try to list some of the things that we do pay attention for and I did uh, listed things like <laughs> rounding errors, uh, such that to kind of point you out, but that list is not exhaustive. There are things on the professionalism which you will be assessed for, which are not on the list, right? Uh, and that is, you may say, ah, it's a little bit unfair that we're gonna get assessed on something that is on, not on the list, but it's not really that you are kind of assessed on the way you think about the list. That's why you are being assessed on that list yourself. So on how you created that list, right? Do you understand that? So you're kind of assessed on, the, uh, on those reports, uh, not on what is in, in here, not on what is in that spec. Um, so some of you will do a very uh, detailed and very um, thorough requirement specifications, 
and some of you will be a little bit more vague and a little bit more absent-minded. So those who are much more precise and kind of a detailed are better, and those who are kind of a little bit vague are kind of worse, right? It's a spectrum. It's not a binary thing. And that's how this assessment works, uh, of how thorough you are and how many things you kind of consider. Um, all right, so that is a little bit complicated because again, it's a little bit different to your usual assignments where the teacher gives you the spec and you just do what it says. And then if the spec is wrong, you kind of do the wrong thing and you say, yeah, I did what the spec said, right? Here, you are writing the spec. So any questions about this, about the process and about those four documents? Keep them short as well and keep them as ballot points or as points like numbered list, for example, for requirements specification or for the non-functional requirements, you can keep them as sort of lists. Uh, don't write, it's not the English or Norwegian language course. It, it's not about the amount of text you produce. It's about the, you know, the points. So use ballot points, use lists, be kind of concise. And then for self-assessment, Sometimes you need to kind of measure something, so it might become a number. Sometimes it, it, it's a little bit like a, a qualitative assessment. Like you may have like, you know, poor, satisfactory, good, or excellent kind of metric. Uh, sometimes it's just a tick box. Like, yeah, it's done, right? So keep it simple. Um, sometimes it's, it's not possible to avoid like um, a qualitative assessment. Um, but most of the time it is, it's just quantitative. It's either true or false, or it's like some number. Um, but sometimes you want to have a qualitative, so then it, it's okay as well, but keep, keep it simple. And then, yeah, about 10 minutes for the presentation. The presentation should include the demo of the product, how it works, how people use it, and also kind of uh, walk through some of the code, like what did you do? How did you organize it? Uh, and some of the kind of assessment uh, things, like what you are really proud of, what was done to very high level of excellence and what could be improved. Uh, obviously for the assignment there is, even though um, um, we don't really have a strict budget, like we don't say you can only spend so and so amount of hours or so and so amount of money on onto the assignment. So there is no strict kind of a budget limit. There is a deadline, right? And you de facto have some form of a budget. Like it, it is flexible, but it has kind of an upper limit. So certain things will be done not to the excellent level because you have to kind of cut some corners. So you, you should kind of talk a little bit, what corners did you cut, uh, right? So what has been uh, done with a lot of time and thought and what was kind of just done to be ticked. Um, all right, so any questions about this? Maybe there will be questions. So if there are questions later, uh, then ask me or post into the course issue tracker, or you can, uh, if they relate specifically to assignment one, uh, you will do it uh, in, the, um, in the labs for assignment one. So what I will do now is I will kind of make a cut in the video and I will record as a kind of a customer what I want from assignment one, okay? And then we'll have kind of a Q&A session about it and it will be a separate video such that people can review it uh, multiple times. Uh, it, it will not be part of the lecture video, it will be kind of a separate video. So the intention is that it simulates kind of a session with a customer where you usually sit and talk with a customer what the customer wants, and then you take notes, and then you ask questions, and then you kind of prepare the specification, right? Um, of what needs to be developed. So you kind of are wearing like a business analyst hat now. You are the, you're not programmers yet. You're kind of a business analyst. You're analyzing what needs to be developed such that you can write the specification and give it to a development team to develop it. And based on that specification, you can also uh, do the uh, validation whether the, the product matches the customer expectations, right? So let me stop the recording.